All right, everyone, welcome to the last virtual farm tour that we have for, for you all. Uh, my name is Bernie O'Rourke, and I'm the Extension Youth Livestock Specialist here at uh, UW-Madison Animal Sciences and uh, the Division of Extension. So we're so pleased that you're here today. Um, you know, it's been a wonderful couple of farm tours that we've had. Uh, we started out with the sheep unit back in the middle of April. Uh, then we, we traveled to the swine unit, uh, had a wonderful session last week with the beef units in both Lancaster and Arlington. And now we're wrapping up here with the farm center. So hopefully uh, you all are on and, and interested in so many great things that the Farm Center is going to talk about today. Everything from farm machinery to planting to um, the feed mill, lots of neat things that you might not have had uh, the chance to engage in before. So um, I'm going to just give you a couple of things to think about here. One, please fill out the, the poll that's on the screen here. If you, I'm gonna give it a few more seconds um, as I wrap up the, the beginnings here, and then I'm gonna end it, but share some things about you. It's always fun to see what y'all are up to. And then um, as, as we go today, I'm gonna keep you all muted. And if you've got some things you wanna put in the chat, please go ahead and do so. Um, if you've got questions as we go along, that's the place to put them, and then we'll answer them as we go throughout the session today. Um, please do keep in mind the chat is only for questions um, and not, you know, engaging with each other. We're going to keep the chat pretty much to questions for the speakers, all right? Um, also, if you are having trouble like with the bandwidth and those types of things, you might want to shut off your video. I know many of you are already shut off your video and that's fine. Um, feel free to keep it on if you wish, but if you do have some conductivity issues, you might want to shut it off. All right. Um, I think that is it. I'm going to move right, move us and transition us over to our speakers today. So uh, Mike Bertram is the superintendent here, and I'm going to spotlight his uh, video right here. That's him. And he's going to be leading the session today. And then we also have Jeff Booth, who is our feed mill manager. And when he is on, we will be, um, we'll, we'll be spotlighting his video for you to watch, okay? So I'm gonna transition this over to uh, Mike and end the poll as is, and um, we'll go from there. Thanks so much everyone for attending and uh, take it away, Mike. Well, thanks, Bernie. So we're here at the Arlington Egg Research Station and I think you're gonna probably put some slides up here shortly and uh, I'll give some back. We'll start with some background of the station. Um, I guess you can go to the next slide. Uh, so just a little bit why why we're here and what we do. We're part of a network of a larger group of egg research stations that the College of Egg runs across the state, and uh, we're here to support research, education, outreach for the College of Egg through UW Madison, and to lead a profitable and environmentally sound agriculture and resource management. Uh, the different stations are around the state because they are uh, have different soil types, different environments, uh, and different specialty crops that are grown in those regions. Uh, so we're essentially an outdoor laboratory for the different scientists in the College of Egg so they can test their ideas in real life conditions. Uh, many of the outlying stations were started uh, with donations of land from counties and cities to get the stations in the early 1900s. We have a little bit different history here in Arlington. Uh, most of the college research in the 1800s took place uh, right around campus, right around Egg Hall, and then in the early 1900 had the Hill Farm, which was just to the west of campus. And uh, if anyone wants to put in the chat box, if you think you know what the Hill Farm is now, but the UW in the early 50s realized campus was growing, uh, the college, the city, everything was growing because uh, after World War II, uh, and they decided to uh, sell that area of the Hill Farm and invest that into the the farms and the buildings at Arlington. So they got about 1,800 acres, added uh, 200 more. So that puts us up to about 2,000. So 
I'm not seeing if there's any chat, but if anyone was wondering, that's the Hilldale area. So if anyone is familiar with Madison, that's where Hilldale Mall and, and residences are. That was the original research that moved up to Arlington. Um, so present size is about 2,000 acres owned and 366 rented. And uh, we're obviously bigger than campus, but if another question if anyone wants to, to try is, how many campus, if we took the UW-Madison campus, set it on top of Arlington Egg Research Station, how many times would campus fit over us? And we'll, we'll visit back to that in a little bit. I'll also just touch on that statue on the bottom, uh, was a statue of a woman sowing seed. Um, it, it used to stand here at this, uh, just to the west of our headquarters looking at Madison. Uh, right now it's in Waupon. It was uh, originally sculpted by uh, Clarence Shaler, and he was from Waupon. It, it was here for many years, but now it sits outside the Waupon Memorial Hospital, if anyone wants to see that up close. Uh, next slide, Bernie. Uh, so at headquarters, we do a lot to support the researchers. Uh, a lot of field operations, tillage, planting, uh, pesticides, fertilizer, harvest. We support the animal units uh, with all the feed, the bedding, manure applications. Uh, we do a lot of repairs at the units and for research equipment and, and everything that involves. Um, we do fabrication of research equipment and it, it takes quite a bit of people to do that. So next slide. Uh, we have a big staff. So myself, uh, we have an assistant superintendent that takes care of all the nutrient management from all the different units as a primary responsibility. Another that uh, works with agronomy and crop protection. Uh, you'll hear from Jeff Booth shortly as a feed mill manager. A uh, couple uh, in the office that work with, with all the financial and keeping all the, the crop and, and records. A couple supervisors. On the maintenance part, we have mechanics, facility maintenance specialists, and a carpenter. Uh, and then we have operators that do a lot of the work, two in the mill and nine that work a lot with the trucking and the field uh, activities. And then seasonally, we, we generally have a couple extra people in the summer to help out because that's the busy time. And we have four or five students that do the mowing and then a couple uh, student interns, including crop scouts. Next. Uh, overall in the crops, uh, get back to that question. So we have, if you took UW-Madison campus, which is about 700 or about 930 acres, and put that on the Arlington station, you could fit about two and a half UW-Madison campuses over our footprint. So if you guessed anywhere two to three, you're, you're probably pretty close. We're about you know, two and a half times the size of UW-Madison campus. So out of those 2,000 or so acres, or out of that total land, about 2,000 is cropland. And about half of that is devoted to crop research and half of it is used for uh, growing feed for the, the livestock that are here. And that breaks down to a total of about 800 acres of corn, um, about somewhere between four and 500 of forages, so about 450, uh, 300 acres of soybeans, and 150 acres of small grains. Uh, other crops in just about anything out there in the world. And I know we have a question, I think that uh, we're gonna put in, in the poll here, how many different crops do you think we have on the station? Um, a few of them are listed here, but there's quite a few more. I uh, also have pastures and uh, tree fields, forestry and, uh, to be specific. So, and then uh, in, 2004, we, we got into doing research on certified organics. So we have about 80 acres certified on the station. So we, we do quite a bit of organic research as well. And next slide. This shows um, about how the crops all fit. Doesn't have a key to it, but you can see a lot of different colors. Uh, so for example, blue is soybeans, Yellow is corn, orange is corn silage, green is alfalfa, and there's quite a bit other crops and research on there. But to give a scale, that's just a little over three miles wide and a little, or east-west and a little over three miles north-south. So it's a pretty big footprint of the station and, and a lot going on here. Next one. And this 
it was a map we had in the past too, but it just kind of shows how, how headquarters fits into where the other animal units are. So we're pretty close to in the center, but kind of between the dairy and, and some of the animal units. All right, so uh, Mike, we've got about uh, some guesses on the, how many different types of pro, uh, things you plan up there, range from like four different things to up to 206 or 300. You want to uh, address the different types of things you guys plant up there? Yeah, so I, uh, I did a count a couple days ago. I counted 82 different types of crops. And, and that would include a lot of different things from vegetables, um, cabbage, melons, you know, kind of anything you typically see in a garden, tomatoes, um, to a lot of different grasses like orchard grass, um, uh, fescues, things like that. And, and then a lot of the normal crops like corn and soybeans and, and things like that too. So, so we are, we're doing a lot of different testing here for different, different researchers. And we'll have on the website that list of all the things that uh, Mike came up with that's listed. So it's an interesting list, one that I never realized. So, and I've been here a long time. So uh, it's a real eye opener. Okay. Anything else to add here, Mike? Um, I was going to just quickly go around and show some of the equipment that we use um, on the station. We, we do, you'll see a lot of red and green because we have generous support from uh, farmers implement in case and also mid-state implement in John Deere that uh, they're supplying with us with some new tractors to use each year but this this would be a chisel plow or specifically a disc chisel that we use for some of the primary tillage we go about eight inches deep uh, you see the discs on the front and the back and then the deeper shanks in the middle um, secondary tillage this is a field cultivator that uh, goes about four inches deep and uh, kind of breaks up the soil and then there's a, a drag in the back that helps to level out uh, the, the field so we have a good condition to plant into. Get to the big tractor here and that's hooked up to a vertical tillage machine or called a, a turbo till. So that goes real light, it kind of moves some soil around and, and usually just does a, a one to two inch incorporate or uh, mixing and then there's what's called a crumbler on the back that kind of breaks up pieces and of soil and, and kind of levels everything off. Then for planting equipment I got out here, this is a, a 12 row corn planter and uh, it's got a central seed delivery. So you put seed in the top boxes and it, with air it blows them out to the, to the, the small boxes. So each row only has a little bit of seed with uh, works really good for quick filling and planting a lot of acres at a time. One of our, our smaller planters is a, a six row John Deere that we do a lot of plots with and other things. Um, it has all electronic seed metering so it can adjust populations on the go. It can it has auto shut off at the end of rows. Um, it's hard to see but all our tractors, at least for planting, have globes on the top. Uh, so everything's done with uh, with auto steer. So we have straight rows and and precise for all our plots. Uh, last one then is is a grain drill that we use for soybeans, small grains, hemp, um, pastures, a lot of things like that. I'll hopefully have a video of that in action later. And uh, again, it's it's all on precision steering and and all that. So uh, just a quick view of what we've kind of the main equipment we use here before we head on over to the mill. All right, thanks, um, Mike. Uh, I think like with all things, we love, um, we love big machinery, we like middle-sized machinery, and it's uh, always great to see all the things that are at Arlington. Uh, lots of different colors, nobody's, nobody's, nobody's biased in Arlington. <laughs> So uh, we're gonna move to uh, Jeff Booth. Jeff Booth is our uh, feed mill manager. And so he um, has been with, the, with Arlington for a, for a number of years. Um, 
Jeff was on one of our first meets evaluation and livestock judging team while his time at UW Madison in the in the undergraduate program there. So uh, he's done a number of degrees, and uh, we're pr pretty proud that he's uh, stuck around and stayed within uh, the state, but then also serving in such a nice role here in his position in managing the feed mill and uh, how it how it relates to all the other units. So if you've been following along, the other units uh, really play together with the feed mill and he's gonna talk about that a little more here today. So uh, take it away, Jeff. Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks for having me, Bernie, and everybody thanks for joining us today. It's a good opportunity for us to show what we do here at Arlington and at the feed mill specifically for me. Um, as Bernie mentioned, uh, um, we do support all the animal units you've seen so far in this series, and we also uh, supply feed to the dairy here in Arlington, also the dairy on campus, the livestock lab on campus, and the poultry research lab on campus. And uh, sometimes we do make it to some of the other ag stations if they need a special diet, or uh, the vet medicine uh, department on campus does get some feed from us as well um, at the Charmony facility, which is still over by the Hilldale that Mike mentioned earlier. Um, kind of over in that area of, of Madison. So um, I'm just going to kind of walk you through the mill kind of as a how feed comes in and hopefully I don't go too fast and miss anything but we'll, we can have questions later on. I'll stick around um, if I uh, have anybody that has a question. But Let me flip us around here. So here is where our bulk feed would be coming in. We'd have a semi that would uh, drop feed into our feed pit here and would be delivering 24, 26 ton of any in specific ingredient. And I would have to have them uh, give me the prior loads um, paperwork so I can assure that the prior load was something feed related. Um, if it was something like fertilizer or treated seed, um, all the truckers are required to do a wash of their of their truck to clean their trucks out properly and supply us with that wash ticket before we would unload. Uh, we would just have to send them away if, if something like that occurred and they couldn't uh, either properly give me the, the, the documentation of their prior load or um, show me that they washed a, a, a suspect ingredient or a suspect truck out. So, um, and then right above it is actually the end of our trip so I'll show you that now, that would be where the bulk feed we, we make comes back down and gets dropped into our big bulk truck. So you can see the large boom um, here, that's what we would use to move up and feed, fill our feed bins at the various animal units. And our truck has five different compartments, so we can take five different diets at once. And our bag go this is our warehouse so back here with ingredients we want to make sure our stuff stays current so we're just tracking expiration dates so for this product which is a vitamin like product called choline chloride we've got the lot number on there and the date it's expiring later in uh, October this year so each of our ingredients out here we have mostly minerals vitamins there's some some salt and amino acids, which amino acids would be the building blocks of protein. And uh, some medication out here. I've got a few examples here we can show of some of the 100 ingredients or so that I work with. Uh, we'll start over here with some corn byproducts or co-products. So a lot of these products that I get in are gonna be um, leftovers from a specific process, either in the food industry or um, some other industry that has a byproduct. So in this case, the flour industry, there's a, they use corn and they have a corn gluten feed and they pelletize that to make it easier to transport. Anybody familiar with the ethanol industry, they take the starch out to make ethanol, the, the fuel, um, and then there's leftover called the distillers dried grains with solubles. So that's a product that we use. Uh, we got so my wheat here that was grown here on station. Another byproduct, canola meal. So if anybody's ever cooked with canola oil, they press out the 
oil, and that's a high protein product that's left, very similar to soybean meal. You get rid of the soybean oil, you got a high protein product. Alfalfa meal, they just ground up alfalfa. This one looks, should look familiar, it looks kind of like oatmeal. It's just kind of steam rolled oats. That goes into some baby pig diets, get them used to uh, um, weaned off of mom's milk. And this is just an example of a, a vitamin trace mineral mix um, that we put into the diets. So we kind of got an idea of the, the different ingredients we've been using. We'll head in on, actually into the mill. And you'll see a lot of different um, bags and machines around. I'll try to explain everything as I go. So the bags I would be weighing in a, either a large tub like this or on a flat platform scale here. And then hopefully I don't break up when I go into the control room. We have a large scale experience. And we kind of have a, an old original panel from the 1970s when this facility was built. And that kind of controls, if I show you up above me, all the different bins we have up above with the different bulk ingredients that the semis bring us. And that gets um, moved into our hopper scale here that's controlled by the dial I just showed you. And everything gets dumped down in to our double rim, ribbon mixer. We can make two ton batches in here in about five minutes. So you can kind of see the top ribbon will push feed towards me. And there's an inner ribbon pushing feed away from me. And so there's a constant back and flow mix. And that's how you can mix that much feed in that little of time. And so the units that I deal with and the grad students will send me a formulation and we put it on a feed order sheet. Each uh, diet's going to have a specific code. So both us and the researchers are on the same page. And then when I add the first ingredients, I'm going to record how much I add to make sure I'm recording the right amount and then initial it and then the lot number. So in this case, the bulk ingredients all have bins and I would write the actual lots from the bagged ingredients in this column over here. So once the feed is mixed and ready to be blown out, um, our facility is a little unique where we use a lot of pneumatic conveying, which means it's being blown around by air. And so the mixture goes over to this pipe and is going up, up to our roof to a different distributor to decide on where it's gonna go. And this is our sampler. We wanna take a sample of every diet that we make just in case there's a problem. And so this little gadget here kinda of shoots in 10 different times while the batch is going out and down the tube and into a sample bag. And here is uh, the last diet we did, which was a dry cow concentrate for our, our dairy. And then the sample just gets um, stored up and stored in here by month. We keep it for about three months. Typically most feed here is gonna be fed up by um, one month to two months. And if there's a problem, we would know, and the vets have come a couple times to grab a sample, but it's never been, um, tested because they figured out what was wrong with those animals before they suspected the feed was the problem. Um, another way you can convey feed other than pneumatically is with a, um, a leg or a belt conveyor, bucket conveyor. So these buckets are on a belt and they just kind of go up. It's hard to push it, but it goes up and around. And then when it gets to the top, it kind of just flings the feed down a chute. And uh, most feed mills would be conveying feed with a, a bucket elevator. We do have one here because we can't convey pellets um, with pneumatic because the pellets would just get pulverized with, with, a, with the air conveying. So I've already showed you where the bulk feed goes out if we mix it. The bag feed would just come in and we could bag it up and sew it up and take it to the units if that's the way they want it. And our third option is our pelleter. And so I'll show you the pelleter. I've got it kind of tore apart so you can see the inner workings. 
So up above would be where the feed comes in and then it gets augered over into the conditioner. And the conditioner means that's where it gets added with steam, so hot steam. You can kind of see the holes back here where the steam would come in and this shaft spins really fast, mixes the feed and the steam to a desired temperature. So as it comes out, I wanna see it. For our pig feeds, we usually go about 170 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. And I can control the amount of steam, I can control the amount of speed and get it to where I want it to go. And then all the feed gets kind of shot down into this pellet die. And you kind of see the pellets that were forced out and they're still in there. So what happens then is this die spins around really fast and these rollers spin on the inside too. And that's where the feed gets pinched and forced out through the die. And then when they get long enough, these, these knives on the door cut it when the door is shut and everything falls down into the basement. And Bernie's gonna show us a video here of the pelleter in action and I can kind of explain what's going on and so in the background here you'll see the where the steam comes in it looks like going a little faster um, Eventually you'll see me grabbing some pellets as it comes out. It's kind of hot when it comes out. And that's why in the basement, we have a pellet cooler. We want to cool the pellets down so that they um, don't break right away when we start moving them. So right here we have a large pellet cooler. I'm down in the basement. And so air gets sucked in through these little slits and through the pellets and through the middle and up a fan and out the roof. And so eventually the pellets kind of make their way down to the bottom and get conveyed over to the leg that I showed you. So that's kind of how the pellets are made. Some of you might be wondering why we pellet feed. Um, a couple of different reasons with um, textured diets or um, diets with whole corn or cracked corn, oats, say like a, a calf starter or, or, or lamb starter, some of those diets, you always see a pellet in there. And that's how they get the vitamins and minerals and some of the protein into those diets. You don't wanna add a meal to whole grain because that product will then sort and you won't get a good um, sample or, or good, the animals won't get a good bite every time they take a bite because sometimes they'll be getting mostly corn so that's why they put it in a pellet. Another reason with the pig feed is we, um, we like the fact that the pigs are a lot more efficient with a, a pelleted diet and it's not as dusty in the facility. And also we've, we've, we found they're more efficient because I can use a finer grind corn in a pellet because with a pellet, you don't have to worry about flowability in bins or feeders at the facility. Whereas if you tried using a really fine grind corn, um, you'll have issues with flowing and you'll have to whack on your bins and your feeders all the time. Um, I'm sure there might be a few more questions on pelleting. I'll, I'll try and touch back on that, but I'm showing you the bottom of our mixer now that I'm in the basement. You can kind of see how big that uh, two ton mixer is. And here's one of our pneumatic blowers. And that's where it would go out to the sampler I showed you. We've had a little bit of problems with um, those texture diets I talked about. So we just in installed a conveyor that I can split to and go over to our leg. So now I can convey those diets over to our leg instead of having to blow them out pneumatically. This other blower looks identical to the one under the mixer is just coming in from the, the, the semi pit that I showed you right away. And our last blower works with our hammer mill. So I was talking about grinding corn really fine, and this is how we would do it. These hammers is what these pieces of metal are called. Spin around really fast. 
Oops, sorry, a little loud there. Um, it, it gets really loud in the mill, so that's why we had to shut down for today's tour. And there's a, there's a screen that I can take out and in with little tiny holes. And so the corn gets pulverized into a, enough, small enough particles that it gets, can get through the screen. So when I shut the door, there's kind of an enclosed area in there. And I can change different screens to make a finer corn or a, or, or a, a more coarse corn, depending on what the diet calls for. And then that just gets blown up into one of the bins above the, the mixer that I can call for. So that we use a lot of gravity in the feed mill industry. So one piece of corn, it could come into this blower, go up to my grinder, get ground in, go up this blower, get mixed into a feed, go up that blower to my pellet mill, come back down, go back up the leg, get put into a textured diet, back into the mixer and out again. So five different times it could go up and down into my, my mill before it goes out to the, the different units. Another big issue with the feed mill is safety. So there's a, a lot of different hazards here. So I've had, I got a lot of equipment open as I walk back upstairs and I've got them all locked out and tagged out. So whenever we work on a piece of equipment, we wanna make sure they don't turn on. We just have it locked out with a lock and whoever's working on that piece of equipment, they're the only ones with that piece or that key to unlock it. So here's the example of the hammer mill I was just using. We have it locked out, so I can't turn that on. Same with the leg and other equipment that in the pellet mill that I had open. It's very dusty in a feed mill. One problem for that would be breathing it in. We've got a dust collector over here. We also have masks that our guys are fitted for to wear. And that also causes a, a danger as far as explosion goes, corn, grain, dust, or any kind of grain dust is really explosive. So a lot of these um, controls and everything, every motor in here is called intrinsically safe or explosion proof. Um, so, and as I mentioned, noise also, we have a required hearing protection in, in the facility whenever a, a piece of equipment is going on. Um, Bernie, how am I doing on time? I did, forgot to look what time you started me. Yeah, we're doing pretty good. It's uh, 1.30. Um, yeah, so there's a couple of questions that came in. Um, like, how many tons of feed do you do each week, do you think? Oh, that's a good question. So um, I'd say we do anywhere between uh, 20 to 25. We typically do about 4,000 a year. And uh, that, to be honest, that's about a good month's worth for a local feed mill that runs 24-7. But like I mentioned before, we're dedicated to serving just the animal units uh, that the UW owns, and we're not selling any feed out to the public. Okay, yeah, that's great. Um, one other, there was a question, Ed, uh, has anything exploded or has there been any problems related to safety um, at the feed mill? Um, one of our uh, our breakers down in the, the control or the, the electronic room down in the basement started on fire. It kind of was sparking up and one of my guys could hear it down there. So he shut that piece of equipment off and inspected it. Um, and good thing he did because some mice have got, had gotten in there and chewed through the wires. And, you know, if that had gone on uh, longer, that could have started an issue down in the basement. That room is specifically um, positively pressured with air so dust does not get in there but it still could have caused a, a major issue here yeah one more question too is um, so in along this line of safety like how often do you clean like um, do you stop production and kind of do a big clean every so often of the feed mill yeah so every week we would clean this this main area I'm standing in um, it would get swept up because this is the, the most used area and it gets the most amount of dust. And it would also be the area that a spark or something that 
you know, if, with a failed piece of equipment might, might uh, cause an issue here. Um, the, the warehouse and the driveway, we do that once a month and we do a lot of other maintenance about once a month. And uh, it's just, it's part of the, the, the routine whenever we're at downtime, we're constantly or doing maintenance. And that's, a, a, you know, a good thing to do to keep the mill running because if we break down, that's an issue. The, the animals always have to eat. So I threw a question in the chat box. What's the weirdest ingredient a researcher, do you think, has asked Jeff to put in a diet? What's the weirdest ingredient? Start putting those in the chat and uh, we'll answer this other question that looks like Linnea has um, asked. How many people work in there at one time, Jeff? I, have, I just have two full-time employees um, and we've had interns in the past and some student workers, but two guys is, is pretty much all you need to run this. And mainly because you have one guy trucking and delivering to all the units and helping out mixing while the other guy is kind of managing the, the feed. So my guys kind of trade off who does the trucking and who stays here at the mill um, managing the, the making of the feed. And, you know, with people being sick and vacation wise, that's when I would fill in uh, making feed um, on the days my guys are gone. Like Jacob has actually gone today and Chad's out in the field. And uh, so it just happens to be good timing that we, we had all our feed made for the week and uh, we could do this tour. Um, I, was, I was forgot to, to touch on one thing as far as drugs go here and medications. Many of you may be familiar with the, the, the veterinary feed directive. And one of the drugs we do have here is Tylen. And it's used um, in some cattle feed, at least, at least here it is. We, we haven't really used much of it lately, but uh, we would track how much we use by weighing out and comparing it to the actual bag weight and, and then just initialing that. And we need a, a, veterinary, uh, a veterinary directive, so hence the name, to use that drug in that diet. So about four, three or four years ago, the FDA decided that certain medications that were deemed medically important to humans had to go through this process to get a vet's approval, and then the vet sends it to the feed mill, and then also got the, the producer. We're just lucky here that the producer, the vets, and the mill are the same entity, and we, can, we work pretty easily with our, with our veterinary crew here. So the, the, you want me to answer the question on the weirdest ingredient, Bernie? Yeah, that'd be great. Go for okay. it. Um, so I had a grad student working on a project that he was bringing me buckets and buckets of eggs. And we were mixing whole eggs that he had cracked individually down on campus, and we were pouring them into distiller's grains and mixing them in my mixer. And uh, so he had pasteurized these eggs, and the, the idea between the, behind that research was they were um, inoculating the chickens with an antibody that ended up in the eggs, and then the egg was then fed to other animals to boost their immunity. And that with some medications like Thailand to see if the diets with the, this interleukin-10 antibody would be a better option as uh, the industry moved away from some of these VFD drugs. And he did it in pigs and sheep and cattle diets. And it was a very, very interesting try. And I, I don't do it again, but I guess I would because that's why we're here. But it was just, uh, I'm sure it was a, a lot of work for him and it was a little extra work for us, but that, that was definitely the weirdest ingredient. Okay, if you get any other questions uh, for Jeff, uh, feel free to put them in the chat box. Um, I think at this point, uh, Jeff, we're ready to move to Mike um, and Greg over in the planting. Uh, any last words, Jeff, of wisdom? And, and then obviously we'll circle back to you here um, at the end for questions. You can get my nose here. It's just... 
Uh, nope, I don't have any final words. It's just, it's, it's kind of interesting here. I've learned a lot more than I thought I would working here about the, the feed industry and mechanics in general. All right, well, thanks again, uh, Jeff. We're gonna spotlight over to Mike here, um, if I can find him. There we go. There he is. All right, so go ahead, Mike. All right, I'm back. I'm at the Wisconsin Integrated Cropping Systems trial now, and you can see the Blaine Dairy in the back. Um, this is one of the longer. Uh, we do have several that go back to when the station started in the 1950s, and then we have a couple of crop rotation studies that go to the 1980s. Uh, this one was started in 1989. And I'm here with uh, Greg Sanford, who's one of the researchers in the Department of Agronomy. Hi, welcome to WIXT. Um, as Mike mentioned, this is a longer term trial, uh, which is kind of unique. A lot of trials maybe last one or two years, maybe three, but this is now 31 years old. And it's pretty large as well for the station. It's about 61 total acres stretching um, quite a ways west. And um, one of the kind of unique aspects about the trial is that rather than you know asking something specific about fertilizer rates or tillage, what we're actually looking at is how different Wisconsin cropping systems compare uh, when we think about things like yield and when we think about things like profitability or the impact on the environment. So soil carbon or um, nitrate leaching, those types of things. And so we have a number of different cropping systems. We have grain cropping systems and we have dairy forage cropping systems. We have some rotationally grazed pasture. So there's a lot going on out here. Um, although right now it's still uh, pretty cold. We don't have a lot going on. Uh, we have some, maybe we can go take a look at it. We have some winter wheat. Um, that is coming up, and Mike and I were just talking about how it's been a real good spring for that wheat. So, uh, see the wheat field here. And we get down and look at these wheat plants. They're uh, they're very healthy. That each individual plant has quite a number of independent stems that can produce seed. In one, two. And um, that's really good because it's not just a single wheat plant that's going to produce one grain head, but each one of these tillers will, will develop into a grain head. So we really do get excited when we see uh, spring wheat growth like this. Um, we've also been out already and planted corn and soybeans in some of the conventional systems here. We did that on the 25th. We're actually doing some planting uh, uh, today. You can see Mark out there doing some planting. But it's been pretty cold. So uh, I think we might actually break and take a look at some of those seeds. We've had um, maybe 85 growing degree days or units since we planted our corn on the 25th. Uh, I'll just show you we have some of those seeds. I don't know if we can see this. This is um, some of that corn that was planted on the 25th. And you can see this long piece here. This is the seed root or the radical. That's the first thing that germinates from the corn seed. This is the growing point um, surrounded by the coleoptile. And this is trying to work its way out of that soil. But um, as I mentioned, uh, Mike figured that we have 85 growing degree units in the bag right now. And it's going to take about 110 to get that corn out of the soil. So we do need um, a little bit more warm weather here. A couple more days. We also dug up some soybeans that were planted on the 25th as well. They're starting to dry out now. There, um, but um, you can see here, corn is a grass, soybeans is a legume. So here, you know, the corn is getting all of its uh, nutrients for germination and growth from this seed, and the soybeans pack all of their nutrients for germination and growth in these big waxy, they're called seed leaves or cotyledons. So um, the soybeans have, have uh, begun to germinate. They have their um, primary root. And then this little hook is called the hypocotyl. 
and that hypocotyl will be the first thing that comes out of the soil and it will eventually pull those cotyledons out and the soybeans will start growing. So things are moving, but they're moving a little slow because we've got some cold weather here. Do you, Greg, do you want to talk about just the different rotations you have going on here? Sure. Um, sure. Okay, so we have three grain rotations, cash grain rotations. So um, those are supposed to be typical Wisconsin rotations where a farmer is growing a crop to sell it um, to an elevator um, for a commodity market. And so we have continuous corn. Um, that's a, a kind of standard system. We're using uh, Roundup Ready and, and other transgenic technologies in that corn. Uh, herbicides is needed to control weeds. Um, and every year for 31 years, we've had corn growing. Then we have a no-till corn soybean rotation. Um, so, you know, similar to corn, but we've moved to kind of conservation tillage practices where we're not tilling that soil. And then we have an organic corn soybean wheat. So that wheat we just looked at, that is the third year of that organic rotation. So here we have to use certified organic hybrids and um, our nutrient sources have to come from uh, manures and other certified organic sources. We then have three forage rotations. So those would be, um, you know, rotations a producer would be uh, managing or growing to feed livestock. Um, two of them are, are alfalfa corn rotations, one of which is conventional. Um, again, using those transgenic hybrids and even transgenic alfalfa now, we're using Roundup Ready alfalfa. And one of the rotations that's got corn and alfalfa in it is organic. Um, so we've got those two, and then kind of at the, at the uh, far end of our forage rotations, hard to see, but this first green It was, Mike, it's kind of hard to hear. Can you block a little bit or something, or go and, and have uh, Greg repeat what he just said? Yeah, um, I was just trying to, to point out that um, at the kind of far end of our forage rotations, we have um, cool season grass pastures. Um, so I heard Mike mentioning uh, orchard grass before, that, that pasture's got orchard grass and um, brome grass and fescue and clover. Okay, techno technology is fun. Can, can you hear me now? Yeah, you sound great now, thanks. Okay, perfect, we got some earbuds in. So um, just pointing out that the, at the um, kind of far end of our forage rotations, we have that pasture system. And that's grazed by um, Holstein heifers uh, throughout the season, we move them every day. We do supplement them with a little bit of cracked corn that actually Jeff provides us. Um, so those are the main systems. In the far uh, distance, um, you, you probably can't see it, but we also do have some native grass systems out here, some prairie. And the reason we have them out here is because this area at Arlington was historically a tall grass prairie. It was actually called the Empire Prairie, one of the largest stretches of tall grass prairie in the state of Wisconsin. And so we use that prairie as kind of a control uh, when we start asking questions about the soils um, and other um, kind of environmental properties, that serves as kind of our um, historical vegetation for the area. So, Greg, um, we got a question uh, related to knowing that it's going to get super cold tonight, probably colder than last night. How is that going to impact this heat that you showed in the pickup? That's a good question. Um, soils are pretty magical for many reasons, one of which is that they um, are pretty good at insulating here. Mike and I are going to scoot away from the wind a little bit. They're pretty good at insulating, so it is going to get cold. The air temperature um, is going to drop into the 20s, but the soil temperature probably won't get below freezing. It's probably going to, um, you know, down at one and a half or two inches where that seed is. It's probably going to stay in the 40s or 50s, and so um, you know, the seed will just sit there and bite its time. It'll, it will eventually warm up and the seed will get going again. But I, but I should point out that, you know, we've planted conventional seed 
that has um, fungicide coatings that kind of neat green and pink color on the seed and that's protecting it from soil pathogens. There's no way we would try to plant a corn crop that was organic or a soybean crop that was organic now. It's just too cold. Okay, that's great. Thanks for that. We don't have any more questions right now, but please feel free to throw them in the chat, chat for uh, Greg and Mike as they're talking about these plants. Okay, Bernie, I'd like to talk a little bit more about some of the, the plot research. Could you bring up the video of the soybean planting? And we do, we do a lot of different, we have a, approximately 30 different researchers uh, on the station. A lot of the research happens in small plots. And uh, this is an example from earlier in the week of one of the researchers planting their small plots. Um, this again is all done with RTK or GPS technology. Uh, it's set up that it's automatically planting a, a new type of seed every 25 feet and automatically uh, tripping. So as the, the tractor comes by, you'll see that the driver doesn't have his hands on the wheel. It's driving a straight line for him. Uh, the person in back is, is dumping the packets into um, a, a cone that sp spreads the seed around. And uh, it's an interesting study as well. They're, what they're, this one is, is it's soybean and looking at uh, different seed treatments for disease control. Um, as it goes through, I don't know if there's any volume or not, but you can hear the clicking as uh, these go and the seed falls down a tube, it falls into the four lower tubes. Uh, it'll show close into one of them here shortly, how it goes into each slot and then it distributes it over 25 feet. And then within 25 feet, the next seed falls. Uh, here you can see where the, you see the pink seed up above and then it's going to open up and see the slide down quick and keeps revolving. Uh, specifically this study, they're, they're actually inoculating for Fusarium graminarium, which is, is a seed rot disease in soybean. Um, the front distributors are, are dropping millet seed, which has been autoclaved, uh, so it's sterilized, it won't germinate, and that millet seed is inoculated with the fungus. So it's planting that right with the soybean seed. Uh, so the soybean seedling, seed, seed and seedlings are basically infected as soon as it germinates. And uh, this is one of the examples of different research we, we do here that uh, testing things in, in small uh, scale like that. Um, it, so, like I said, about 30 different researchers, a lot is in small, small plots like that. They test different hybrids of corn, varieties of soybeans on large scales so that uh, those results can be out there for farmers to get an unbiased look at how, uh, what the yield potential of is of some of these, these hybrids because uh, across the state, they test about 450 different hybrids of corn. We do have a demo here with all them side by side. Uh, and beyond, beyond just like the agronomy, some of the small plot and soils look at fertilizers. Uh, they look at cover crops and the effect that that's having. Uh, they look at water runoff. There's, there's some things with water collection and uh, seeing how much phosphorus is moving off the site with and without manure application. Uh, so there is quite a bit of uh, interesting research going on. And again, the, the whole idea is that it's applicable to Wisconsin, helping out Wisconsin farmers uh, to be more environmentally sound and profitable. So Mike, um, this information is put in some sort of a document to share with farmers and producers, not only here in Wisconsin, but in other states, right? Yes, yeah, so, so some is available on, on websites, but uh, a lot of what we're doing is just the, the base research. Uh, the next component of that is, is extension, uh, which helps disseminate and, and kind of teach all this information. Um, some though it is directly like we, we, we have a summer field day where the public can come in and uh, see some of these plots firsthand and, and have all the experts here talking about them. That is usually in late August. Uh, there are sometimes other tours through the year as well, and both here and, and at the other research stations across the state. 
but a lot of the either publications written by the the scientists and then a lot of them do have extension connections too for for doing meetings and getting the information out yeah so mike makes a great point so if you're in uh in uh connected with your extension your county extension uh group uh contact the AIC, um, educator there or maybe even your 4-h um, person there they can connect you with some of these things that are offered in uh in arlington at the research station they have grazing days and field days and lots of things where you might be able to see a lot of this in person uh, when we're able. So, um, okay, that's a great question. Go, taking back to you, Mike. Okay, how long do you wanna go? Do you wanna show another video or should we wrap it up with some questions? Well, we can show the, the drilling pasture video and then I think, yeah, then let's do questions. So I'll pull that video up and if you wanna just prompt them while I do that. Okay, uh, so I took a, it's usually windy out here in Arlington as it is today. And it was really windy when I took video a couple weeks ago when we were seeding some pastures at the beef farm. Uh, so uh, I just wanted to show, that would be that, that John Deere drill in action. Um, this, this was over at beef grazing. Uh, we had a, a pretty nice seed bed prepared. It was, it was pretty firm, pretty, pretty crumbly. You can see that the dust was really blowing. Uh, seeding, this one was a mixture of alcite clover and alfalfa along with uh, smooth brome grass, tall fescue, and um, one other grass. And uh, it was a field that historically has been a pasture. We had it in corn last year so that we could kind of break up that pasture cycle, uh, kill some of the thistles that were coming in there. Uh, so there's a little bit of corn residue. Uh, we had chisel plowed it, uh, field cultivated, and then ran a cultipacker over to get that firm seed bed. And this just kind of that, that drill in action so that you kind of see. So we seeded about a quarter inch deep, um, it pressed wheels behind, firm the seed in. And if I had a picture now, I think it's just starting to come up. So it's uh, hopefully later in the season, that'll be a field we can have the the beef cattle out on. Okay, does anybody have any questions for Mike and uh, Greg? How many uh, total uh, employees work at the Arlington facility? Those are maybe some questions. I mean, I think it was on the slide, but there was a question on that. Can you say, uh, address that again, Mike? Yeah, we, we have about 25 that work for headquarters or farm center, but Overall for the station, I, I don't have an exact number because there's the dairy unit, the animal units, and all the researchers around. Um, we, we've said on a really nice day in summer when everyone's out here working, we could probably have 200 people on the station at a time working. So, so I don't have an exact number, but I, what I like to say is when someone asks me how many people work here, I like to say all of them. <laughs> That's a great question or great answer. Um, so related to, um, you know, I guess there was a there was a question about this, but um, careers. If someone was interested in getting into like things that Greg were doing and some others, maybe Jeff, you could hit some answers to this. Um, how could you prepare if you were a young person that was interested in this type of agriculture, agronomy, feed, that sort of thing? How does one prepare themselves? Uh, to to do that. Um, you're working on the audio again. Um, so preparing for careers, well, I think one would be starting with education. And my experience, at least with agronomy and plant science, went back to a, a plant science class my sophomore year of high school. And I learned uh, all about plants. I learned that there was something called agronomy, and I decided that's what I wanted to do. So I ended up uh, getting a lot of plant classes, going to Madison for UW Madison for agronomy, out of the wind. and then uh, it kind of went from there. I, I ended up in grad school for working at soybean research, and then started in with the egg research stations after that. Uh, but I'd say the biggest first step is is uh, having an interest, and then. Uh, get the education part either through uh, A or science or 4-H projects, things like that. 
Jeff, do you want to hit hit a little bit on your side of the the career part? Um, like Mike just mentioned, how I ended up here was um, Dr. Crenshaw found out I chased pigs in 4-H and he hired me for a summer at the swine unit. And now here I am, I don't know, 20 years later, kind of still working for him as, as a feed supplier. And uh, it's just finding a way to just kind of try something out, either if that's a co-op when you're in high school in FFA or an, an SAE project and uh, just trying different things while you're in 4-H is, is always a great idea just to see if you like it and then just reach out to somebody in the industry and see if you can do a ride along. I know, uh, uh, you know, veterinarians do that a lot with um, students in animal science that are in college looking to possibly make that their career. Uh, you'll be surprised how many people would be glad to just have you come along for a day or a half a day um, and, and just show you what the, the life is like on their, on their job site. I actually had a ride along with a crop consultant on my dad's farm too when I was in high school and that, uh, you know, that helped seal it too that I knew what I wanted to do. Okay, that's great. I think that's helpful for kids that are trying to figure that out. I do know that when I was a kid, a kid going to college um, at SDSU, South Dakota State University, um, I got engaged uh, through range science. Uh, so um, I had an interest in pastures and that sort of thing and grasses. And so I took a lot of range science classes. So South Dakota is a little bit more Western. So um, that's what they called it. But um, it's kind of interesting to kind of fall into some of those things. And um, I knew um, as a young person growing up in Southern Minnesota, um, range science wasn't um, uh, on my radar. So, you know, it's every experience you get, every opportunity, anybody you kind of, uh, kind of fall, you know, fall into, whether it be a ride along or those types of things that really sparks your interest and um, uh, kind of follow those through if they do spark your interest. Um, a lot of good things can kind of come from that. So, um, any other questions for Mike or Jeff or even Greg today as we kind of wind up? Um, I think Mike's got a great picture showing the, the planter and the, the uh, tractor kind of basically, I think, finishing up corn um, up at the Arlington Research Station. So they're finishing this, this field. They saved it for us. Thanks, Mike, uh, for us to be able to do... Um, uh, finish up here and see that going on in Arlington. I'll switch the video around. Sorry about that. And this is a modified planter. It was a six row planter, but made to go on to three points. So you can see right now you can pick the whole planter up and that helps with some small plots, especially in tight places where you have to kind of back in and get everything straightened out before where it, it's a little harder to back up when you have uh, the hitch and keeping everything straight. All right, so we don't have any more uh, questions in the chat, but to, to kind of round us up today, um, make sure you've, uh, there will be, well, firstly, there'll be an email that will be sent to you that will have um, two things, a link to a survey that we'd love for you to finish and to fill out. There's only about five questions, so it's nothing too, um, That'll take you too much time, but it certainly gives us um, the opportunity to see if you enjoyed this and what things about this that you learned and liked. Um, the other part of that is if some of you are interested in wanting to get educational credits or points through your programs of agriculture or 4-H um, to go to the fair, there'll be a link to the form that you can use uh, to, to get um, credit that you can turn into your county, all those types of things. Um, and this is our last uh, tour. Um, if you like them, let us know. Um, let us know what other things you'd like to hear from us about educationally. Uh, we'd love to help that out and to kind of follow up with some other new things here in the next month or so.
So follow us on any kind of social media you can find, mostly active on Facebook and Instagram. You can search by Wisconsin Youth Livestock Program on any of those. Um, and then we also have um, a website too um, that you can uh, access with all these resource materials. This is being recorded, uh, so follow up and um, that kind of information will be shared and you can share it with other friends when this recording is available um, next week. All right. Thanks for coming along with us during this virtual farm tours. And um, we look forward to maybe seeing you around this summer when we're able. And um, Jeff and Mike and Greg, thanks so much for keeping us um, up to speed on all things agronomy, how plants and, and farm operations uh, connect with feed in the feed mill and then also to our livestock project. So uh, thanks for kind of helping us uh, complete the circle here a little bit of uh, nutrition for livestock and then um, how that all happens. So have a great day everyone and thanks again to our speakers this week. Um, we'll see you around. <laughs>